I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'm Dominique Pleasant Moore. And I'm Shelly Barber. And we will be presenting today Making the Most of Reading Workshop. Um, and here we have, I'm Dominique Pleasant Moore, ELA K5 Instructional Lead. And I am Shelly Barber working with the district as a literacy coach K5. There we go. And here's our little welcome slide. On this slide, I have shared our email address. If you need to get in touch with us, um, you can just click there. Our norms today, um, we will uh, be present, participate, use uh, the chat, but since this is recorded, we've added a Padlet that we're gonna share with you and you can put all questions there. And um, we will be checking and responding to your questions that way. Um, be open to new ideas and share ideas with others. And you can share those ideas also on that Padlet. Um, I've added here that is linked. You can click on the tools and tasks for NTI 2.0 that ELA is using. Let me go back. Sorry. And this is just some protocols, tasks, and tools for student engagement during NTI. Um, here we have, it, if you're introducing new material, here are some suggested tools that you can use with your students. Um, engaging with an, uh, content, you can use these uh, tools, Google Site, Google Classroom, um, all different types of tools that we're suggesting as an ELA team. Uh, support and communication, giving you ideas of offering office hours with Meet, Calendly, parent communication app, um, assessing progress. Here's some tools that we suggest you use, synthesizing and composition. Those are tools that we suggest. Here we have the NTI 2.0 Teacher Toolkit, and I'll also click on that. And this is our Teacher Resource Toolkit, and this is just a quick way to get to that. It has your uh, JCPS curriculum frameworks. It has your teacher backpack. It has your national quality for online teaching standards. It's just full of all types of resources. It has uh, choice board templates, um, all types of instructional tools that you can click on and use during NTI. Um, also more digital tools that we love using, instructional delivery. Everybody's using Jamboard. The kids love using that. It's very interactive but I wanted to share this tool with you so you knew where it was. You can have that saved and easy to click on and use during NTI and as you are planning. Also, we have um, protocols and preferred tools for synchronous engagement task in ELA. So if you want to do a digital gallery walk, we suggest these tools that can be used. And if you click on those links, it'll take you to better lessons and it'll give you examples. You can watch a video of a teacher doing it. Um, it tells you how to implement it during NTI and it also has other ways that you can use it during e NTI. All right. And so that's there for you to use and have just um, as a resource for planning. Our objective today is we will examine the important components of a literacy workshop so that I can make informed decisions for my students. Um, we will investigate how to build a community of learners so that I can begin to plan meaningful activities uh, for my workstations and that tool and task uh, link is there to help you as you plan. Here we have our instructional framework. Um, so the instructional uh, framework shows us how um, our literacy workshop 
is divided up where you're spending your time and what that should look like. Um, it's talking that saying that whole group is 20%, then you've got guided reading 25%, independent work is 25%, and focus group is 25%. And then you have that 5% when you want to bring your students back and reflect and evaluate, um, give feedback. If we're looking at our independent section, which we'll be talking about today, this tells us what teachers will be doing and what students should be doing during this time. Um, make intentional connections between whole group, guided reading, and independent work. Teachers will provide individualized activities based on student need that is informed by observation and assessment. All this is being led by ob uh, observations you've made and the assessments the students have taken. The students will utilize voice and choice, engage in daily independent reading, um, engage in writing about reading and writing. They're going to do word work. There's going to be literacy stations, um, project-based learning, inquiry, um, co-create, and engaged in personalized um, learning. Now, possible routines and procedures. This is we're going to talk about establishing norms and routines for the workshop model, including cues for minimizing transitions. And we really, really want to focus on routines, routines, routines. But we're going to talk about that um, during this session. <clears throat> Why uh, the workshop model? Why? Because differentiation. Um, it, differentiation allows us to tailor that instruction to meet the student's needs. Personalization, make sure we've made accommodations for each student. Um, and individualization, just like differentiation, personalization, we are making sure we're meeting those individual student needs. <clears throat> the information that you gain from assessments, whole group, and guided reading helps you to decide what students will be working on during that independent practice. Um, those assessments are going to help you figure out how to differentiate, how to make it personal, how to make it individualized for that student. Purposeful independent work. It cannot be just any kind of independent practice. It has to have a purpose. It must be independent practice that offers confer conferencing with students, um, expected action as part of the student learning experience. Um, you've got to use your assessments with help to, uh, with the decision making for what activity students need. It must be evidence and research based. Um, with clear focus on students practicing literacy skills and concepts. Um, it must be practice that is tightly aligned to learning standards from the current and previous units <clears throat> for the grade level. Oh, and Shelly and I's favorite part is the classroom setup and schedules are important. This is this is your, that foundation we have to put down and it starts here with your classroom setup. Um, here we've got pictures, you can draw it out on paper, you can move stuff around, but <clears throat> this is super duper important. You want to create a rich environment with student work, word walls, anchor charts, etc. It's just you're creating that world for that student to live in a world of literacy and the setup of your classroom is very important. You want to make sure you have a purposeful space. Every inch of your room should have a purpose. The way it's set up, you've got to be thinking at all times, what's the purpose? Is this going to work? Is it a place students will want to come to read and write? Um, Shelly, do you have anything else to share? Yes, in the library, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that when we create those libraries for students, to keep in mind that we are organizing them according to genre and um, even other ways, like all the magazines or, you know, things like that uh, for kids. And be very picky about what you're putting in your, uh, in your library. You don't want to just 
shove all the books you own into the classroom library. We want to keep um, things intentional. For example, like Dominique was talking about, when you design the unit, you might have particular books you do want to sprinkle in there, and then you want to keep the kids involved. And this is where they'll have a lot of choice and voice. They they will tell you which ones they want in their library too, for uh, engagement. And it's they're supposed to be reading for enjoyment. They can have tasks during the writing work uh, during the literacy workshop, but. Um, we're really wanting, the research states that we are really wanting kids having time on print and in an enjoying way, letting them independently peruse. <clears throat> yes, I totally agree. You, yes, this is the most important part. One of the most important parts, building that foundation is setting up that classroom and <clears throat> schedules. And I wanted to share during NTI teachers have started creating these Bitmoji classrooms that are a virtual version of their own classrooms. And it is a way that we can't set up our classroom right now for face-to-face, -face, but you can set up your virtual classroom through Bitmo using a Bitmoji. And I have one to share later and I just jumped on the bandwagon and think it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Here we've linked the Padlet that I was talking about earlier, Padlet is another tool that you can use to share with students. Um, when they're, you can create each column, you, tell, you can set up in your own little Padlet what you want to, students to look at. You can link, you can share pictures. Um, it, it is an amazing tool to use during NTI. So here we've got, when we're talking about classroom setup, we'll come back and have a look at what that looks like. We've got community, um, choice, independent reading, read to self, um, our research, inquiry, um, partner read, shared reading. And when we're talking about, as you're watching um, the session, and, and you need to stop the video and go here to ask a question, or even if you're watching and you think, oh, wait, I've got a picture of my own classroom set up, please share it. We want you guys to share through this Padlet. Um, share questions, share ideas, share pictures, maybe a link of something that you think would help another teacher. This is where you can put that and it'll be here and Shelly and I will be going um, back and forth looking to see if we need to answer some questions or maybe we find something and we may be adding more things to the Padlet. But um, this is just also a great tool that you as teachers can use during NTI. All right, and now reading uh, and writing workshop. We showed the instructional framework, but this is what it looks like when we're looking at how do we divide this time up? What does this time look like in my classroom? So we have the essential components of literacy instruction here, and then we have reading and writing workshop, our whole group, which is our mini lesson, um, that you want to go about 20 minutes, but I'm a talker and I allow my kids to be talkers. I, I really had to almost set a timer for myself because this part I could lose control of and then it would I would lose time everyone everywhere else. So in the beginning, I always had to set a timer at the beginning of the year and be like, okay, we've gone 20, 25 minutes. Dominique, we have to stop and move on. So during this 20 minutes, teachers will model reading or writing strategies. They're going to teach workshop routines, and we're going to talk about those routines and how important those routines are, those routines, procedures, and expectations. Um, that is very important. That comes before everything else. Nothing else on here will work without setting up, that, setting up those routines, procedures, and expectations. Now, during this time, students will participate in reading and writing strategy practice. Then we have this 60-minute block, um, writing an independent practice. But during that 60 minutes, we've got te our teacher is meeting with um, guided reading groups. Shelly, do you want to talk about those the guided reading piece? Yes. Um, a lot of questions come up about trying to fit it in. And um, and when what what do you do when you have five groups? 
um, of guided reading that you're trying to work through. Um, we know what kids need. We can make those informed decisions about how to use those minutes. Um, but I can, but I also want to challenge you, especially when we're in person in the brick and mortar classroom. We um, and I was guilty of this too. My transition times were that's where I could tighten up as kids were transitioning. I could gain some minutes there and um, definitely in guided reading. Um, sticking to that template, whether you're using Fontas and Pinnell. Uh, guided reading resources, um, literacy footprints, um, those, you know, just any of, you know, books that your school wants to use for guided reading, it doesn't matter. The publisher, they're all wonderful, have, you know, different wonderful books within them, and we should be using multiple publishers. But I can express that using the template, the guided reading template, and uh, planning is uh, with the Jan Richardson really helped me keep things tight, concise, and moving the kids along. Um, I, I just wish I had had it earlier in my career because I could have really gotten a lot done in that workshop time. So that's just something that I would really work on first. And like Dominique said, if you don't have the routines, the expectations uh, taught, not stated, not hung up on a poster, literally taught and practiced over and over again, you're not going to get to any of this. And you're going to lose minutes constantly. Instructional minutes are going to go down the drain. So um, just keep those three things in mind. Transitional time, tighten front load all your expectations constantly and revisit it and use that Jan template for your guided reading because it will keep it tight with whatever guided reading books your school is using. Yeah, I agree. That's Shelly and I both believe that that those procedures routines, if they're not in place <clears throat> this time schedule is not going to work. You're going to lose so much time. So it's best <clears throat> to put the time up front so that this will work smoothly when you're ready to introduce um, the reading writing workshop to your students. Next, we have whole group reflection and share for 10 or 15 minutes. And this is an important part too. Um, teachers are going to summarize reading writing strategies and clarify. Um, <clears throat> the important part here is students are going to share and articulate their learning and provide feedback peer feedback, and they absolutely love this time. They love sharing what they've written, sharing what they've read, sharing what they've talked about together, and this is just an important piece. It seems like, oh, maybe I can skip that today, but even that five, ten minutes of them sharing their work um, makes a whole lot, it makes a difference to them, and it makes them feel important and makes them understand um, when they share what they're learning. And then we have the whole group writing, 20 minutes, where teachers will conference with small <clears throat> focus group, assess, and students are writing, 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 writing. All right, <clears throat> here is my example of um, my little Bitmoji classroom. So I wa I saw a presenter on uh, the Kentucky Go Digital, and I was like, wow, that's amazing that we're going into NTI, and this is one way a teacher can give students that, oh, you've got a classroom. Here's our little classroom. You can create uh, a math classroom, your reading, your literacy classroom. You can create a homeroom where it's individualized for students, um, but this one I created just to show um, you can create a um, anchor chart together on whiteboard. Then I just, you do a little snapshot and put it into your Bitmoji classroom. Um, 
books on a shelf. You can add a book that maybe you want students to be reading while you're doing guided reading or doing something with other students. If you click on it and it'll take you straight to that YouTube um, epic where students might be able to pull books that they want to read or have books read to them, that can be linked in. <clears throat> Over here is that um, like the little Padlet icon. If you click on it, it will take you to our Padlet. You can have that there for your students and they know, oh, there's that Padlet icon. I can click there. I just go here. So there's so many different things that you can do with a Bitmoji classroom that I wanted to share how I created my own and, and I really enjoyed doing it. I even shared it with my family and they were just cracking up that they're like, wow, that's amazing. Like, it's, it's so funny to do. And I even have my little Clorox wipes over here ready to go in my little Bitmoji classroom. <laughs> oh my God, that's awesome. And this is where Dominique has put so many amazing tools in here. So you might want to pause at any time and uh, at, with this uh, video and just, you know, click over to our um, slides and click in there and see yeah. what some cool things she's got going. Yeah, and you can play around with it. And what I learned after that, I joined a little group just to get, you know, on Facebook that is called um, Bitmoji Craze for Educators. And there are so many teachers out there that are sharing um, their rooms where you just copy them and can put it all together. And it's so much easier than um, when I was trying to do it on my own. So this also is a great tool that you can use not only during NTI, but once we get back face to face. So I just wanted to share uh, my little Bitmoji with you, Bitmoji Classroom. Um, and here, now that's the question, what are the other students doing? Um, while the teacher is working with guided reading groups, we need to be very intentional about what the other students are doing. Uh, purposeful learning experiences foster independence in your students. Um, so here we've got some examples of what are not purposeful learning experiences. We don't want worksheets. Um, we don't want um, worksheets or copying spelling words, looking up definitions for spelling words or unrelated computer games. We don't want nonsense word practice, but what um, purposeful learning could be. Um, independent reading for enjoyment or a strategy to be practiced. You know, kids just picking books um, so that they can enjoy reading or you've given them a specific strategy to practice during that reading time. Partner reading. Students love reading with a partner and some teachers are like, oh no, this gets out of control. But when we get to that piece, we're going to talk about how routines and procedures make that partner reading work flawlessly. Um, we're going to discuss, have discussion groups, literature circles for our older students. You can do um, book clubs, responses to reading, inquiry projects, and research based on interest, which when students are working on things that they love and that they're interested in, it's amazing how focused they can be and how much learning goes on during that time. <clears throat> Excuse me demonstration and reflection of strategy use in context of independent reading. So those are the things we want to see while the teacher is working with guided reading groups. Um, and it's super easy and, and it's possible to do. And here it, we're back to communities and we really want to dig deep and talk about um, community building. So community building and what does that look like? When you are building a community, it empowers students to be held accountable for their learning. Um, by building a community, this student will hold other students accountable for behaviors, learning and caring for the other students. I've been, when I was in the classroom and we built this community and someone else gets off task, while I was with the guided reading group, another student would be like, oh, no, 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 come on. And they get each other back focused. So when you build this community and give them that kind of safe environment to share and learn, it makes your job as a teacher so much easier. These, uh, this step needs to be taught the first couple of weeks of school. 
and honestly, I, I say community building should go on throughout the whole school building. Um, it helps to lower um, discipline and behavior issues. This helps to get your classroom management under control. So those first few weeks, you just need to spend that time showing kids how to come into the room, how to do that, how to sit with your group of students, your group of um, peers. It's just when you give those expectations, you revisit those expectations throughout the year and they've got those routines, it, your room runs flawlessly. Um, and it also says here, you've got to go back, you know, go back and reteach those expectations. When you come back from a break, even if it's like only been like a three, four day break, you've got to go back over those routines. When we come back from Thanksgiving, go back over those routines. When we come back from Christmas, spring break, you, you have to go back over them and it makes a, a, a huge difference. And it takes a lot of, um, a lot off of the teacher and you can do that guided reading with that little guided reading group and everybody else is working because they know their expectations. They know what they're supposed to be doing. So when routines are in place, it lowers the anxiety and it builds students respect and trust for themselves and each other. Um, and it just makes uh, your literacy workshop work. Shelly, do you have anything you want to share about community? I think you totally embraced all that that you and I and many, many educators out there believe and probably do in the JCPS classrooms. I also just wanted to touch base that that's where um, you become very picky about the materials that you use and don't worry so much about content yet. Because that's what I did. I was like, oh my gosh, we got to get content in. We got to be ready. But it got to be ready. But like Dominique says, if you don't slow down and in the beginning front load that, that community expectations and how we care about each other, um, in order to do that and build readers and writers, you have to pick rich text, things that they're interested in. You have to be reading fabulous uh, picture books and or uh, text passages or you know whatever it takes that um, engages your your students and then your main focus is okay we're going to practice this this is great and give them feedback constantly i noticed you did this i noticed you did that sometimes when i was closing up a, a workshop i just would turn it over to them and say how are things going and uh, a funny story at Wheatley, I had uh, second graders and they were like, one of them said, okay, that center over there sucks and you need to change it. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> tell me more about that. What do I need to do? And when he, he explained it, I was like, yeah, it is kind of boring. Ugh. <laughs> so we switched it out. So uh, that also builds that um, trust, like Dominique was talking about, that students own their workshop and they own their own learning. And so just take time to do those little things that you, you'll have a great year. Yeah, and so, you know, what it looks like face-to-face, -face, you're making those anchor charts together of what it looks like and you ask students, okay, so what would it look like, but what should it not look like? And in NTI, you need to do those same things. Create, you know, on a whiteboard, create those anchor charts, talk about with students. Um, you need to talk about a dress code during NTI. I was watching, um, I was listening maybe to a podcast and a teacher was saying she had no idea to think about a dress code. She had kids showing up with no shirt on and, you know, and so she's like, oh, so start building those kind of routines for NTI. What are the student expectations during that NTI time when you're meeting with them for a guided group or, you know, you're meeting in Google Classroom or you're doing different things? What are their expect? What are your expectations for them? And so you want to build those same routines that you would build face to face. You want to also build those routines and expectations during NTI. Now, principles for fostering independence <clears throat> in literacy. 
We've talked about that trust and respect. And when you build uh, trust and respect in the classroom, students will feel um, confident enough to share their thoughts and ideas, and they'll feel part of a discussion. They'll discuss, be part of the discussion. When they trust and respect that environment, they grow as a learner. So you wanna make sure you're building that community. Like it says here, a nurturing environment. Um, it's the most important piece for the literacy workshop, it, and it helps with your classroom management. That trust, respect, and community go together. They're like hand in hand. <clears throat> Giving student choice. Um, when students have choice, motivation increases, and student success seems to increase because they feel like they're a partner in the learning. It's not just you as the teacher telling them what to do. They feel like you are a part, they're a partner and they're working on it together and they know why they're doing it and they know why and they're wanting to do it. So it's important to have that uh, choice in there for students. And then you have accountability with student empowerment. When students can find <clears throat> and are given a choice, uh, a chance to choose meaningful reading and they can be part of their learning, it empowers them to have that account and they'll have that accountability and and that also helps with your classroom management when they know oh i've got to do this but they want to because they've been empowered by having that choice um, and then we have brain research development appropriate tasks and be aware um, students will take brain breaks throughout the workshop uh, <clears throat> with that brain research, we're building that reading stamina, we're building them to be independent readers, and then we also need to remember with brain research and development, we want to give them a break too. And I've learned, even as an adult, since the spring through Zoom meetings, after a while, I start to go like, I lose focus and I need a brain break. And so, you know, we are focusing on building that reading stamina and um, their independent reading piece but and working on the work, but they also need those brain breaks and, and stops. And then we have the 10 steps to independence, and that's linked here because I'd like for you guys to see that. <clears throat> All of these principles are... Um, are key. Here with the 10 steps of teaching and learning, um, identify what is to be taught. You want to uh, set a purpose. You've got to create that sense of urgency. You've got to let them know what, it, why are we doing this? Um, then you want to re create those anchor charts of your desired behavior. Show them what it should look like and what you want. And then I always had the kids you know, I would get kids to show me what should it not look like? And they loved it and they would crack up and they would just show me what it shouldn't look like. And then we went back again to show what it should look like. Then you want to model those desired and you want to model the least desired, just like I was saying, they would model what it should look like. And then they would model what it shouldn't look like. Um, place students around the room. You want to practice and build stamina, stay out of the way and confer about behavior quick signal, come up with those signals. I always had like a little chime that would chime. They knew it. They knew when we're coming back to reflect and meet back together and check in on those groups. How did it go? Like Shelly said, one student came up and told her that I don't really think that's a good um, station, which when you have that trust and respect and that community, you can have those conversations and say, well, let's look at it. Maybe it isn't working. And then, you know, you've got to be able to admit, even as an adult, as the teacher, go, okay, that wasn't great. We can revisit that. Let's see what we can do about that. Um, so these principles are, are just key to developing the independence <clears throat> in literacy for your uh, literacy workshop. And here we have choice. Um, Student choice, like we have said, is key to turning students into readers. When, even when I was little and they would make me read specific things, I read it, but I was like, eh. But when I could choose the books I wanted to read, it made a world of a difference. And that is how I felt I grew as a reader. Um, when I had to sit in a classroom and teachers 
constantly giving me what to read, I was not loving reading. And then when finally my mother made, and uh, you know, she said, if you read this stuff they're giving you at school, then we will pick out books that you want to read at home. And it turned me into a forever reader. So student choice is key to turning students into readers. <clears throat> choice empowers students. It shows students that you value their input, that you value um, them as a student, and it can lead to conversations. When students pick out what they want to read and they have choice, they can talk all day long about the book that they picked out and how much they loved it and why they loved it. And like I said, giving them choice can lead uh, to them being lifelong learners. Um, student choice happens when students are able to choose books for their personal book box or book bag. And this is giving students access to books that, um, that they want to read. This will lead to student engagement and time to explore. Uh, Shelly, do you have anything to share about student choice? Um, I had read something really important for that I just need to share, especially for our, our intermediate teachers that have a lot of the comprehension on their shoulders about helping kids navigate test questions and and dealing with the the um, unknown of the passages. And it had talked about giving them choice and letting them read as much as they want of their own builds not only vocabulary, but the background schema that they need when they are thrown in a testing environment. And um, because scientists have proven that we have, to, that we comprehend by using our background schema. And if we're constantly giving them you know, uh, if we're constantly driving what they read, then like Dominique said, she didn't really remember, you know, when, you know, when you're given something to read that you don't really like, you, can, you can't recall it and you haven't built any background schema for it at all. So um, I can't stress after reading that article, how important it is that we give kids time to read what they want to read. Yeah, and we're going to talk about, you know, what procedures and what you need to do to teach kids how they're supposed to choose their books, and, and we'll talk about that later. But student choice is, is super key um, to building a lifelong learner. Okay. Oh, you don't want to go back. I want to go back and uh, is our Padlet on this one? Oh, it took me all the way out. I'm sorry. You know, there's days with technology that I'm like, oh my. Okay, we'll just get it. We'll just go to the next slide. Um, independent reading and read to self. Oh, I'll click on the Padlet here. So going back to the Padlet, <clears throat> when we're talking about um, that classroom setup, I didn't give you a chance to come to the Padlet, but you can come here, like I said, after the session is over, and we want to look at the literacy space and space to read. There are several examples of what some classrooms look like and different setups. Um, Shelly talked about, you know, the organization of books. And um, here's a place, if you have a picture of your own uh, classroom or if you have created a Bitmoji classroom that you want to share, just click that plus button and you'll, you can add. When you click on it, it will show you how you can upload something, you can link something, <clears throat> it can take you to Google, you can share a picture. And we would love for you guys to share anything that you wanna share in, in this Padlet with teachers. Uh, and this is where you would put classroom setup ideas. Um, community, 
We talked about building that community and here anchor charts are an amazing tool to use to walk through the process and what the procedures should, should look like. And kids love um, creating these together. And that's the only way, you know, one way it makes it work, creating those anchor charts together. And if you look here, it says students were taught how to listen and respect, speak to each other when collaborating in literacy circles. And there they're working together. That, and, and it's working because those procedures were put in place. Um, if you have pictures of your anchor charts that you use to uh, introduce those procedures uh, at the beginning of the year, you can share those with us also. Put those there. Um, let us see what you used at the beginning of the year um, or pictures of your students and what that community looks like in your classroom. That's great. Add it here. Um, when we were talking about student choice, um, see teacher directions for the slides. I'm going to click on that and Shelly's going to share this literacy station. Okay, this teacher had... Um, Bill, a slideshow. This is just one of the slides, but um, we were thinking, you know, that you could send the slides to the students a week ahead, like if you knew what the stations were going to look like, to help kids know what was going to come up, and maybe they could identify um, the goals and maybe turn some of the accountability over to them. Um, second, I've had first graders that could identify their goals. So I believe first graders could do it, but I know that um, it depends on the year that you have and what group you have that year. So I, I do understand that. But just if your kids are ready to identify, well, maybe I, I really need to work in this station uh, more because I want to work on fluency more, or I need to work in this station because I'm in the middle of a project and I need to revise some of the writing that I've done. Things like that. Um, it, 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 gives the, it gives you free time to be in guided reading and to focus on your guided reading because they have identified what they're going to do and that accountability they place on themselves. And then you can always say, okay, this is what you've decided. Now follow through. You know, and they will. I mean, they tend to just really follow through when they have identified it and placed it on themselves. So I thought that that was um, a good way to virtually, you know, you could make some kind of slides if you're doing NTI and figure out how you were going to do that. Or you can, or in person, send them the slideshow, you know, ahead of time so that they can see what is expected of the week and where their teacher put them. But then go back and, and decide together, maybe that's not gonna work this week. Great, yeah. Um, also, we have students choose <clears throat> their own genre and co-author to create. This partnership is writing a fictional story. So here they are working together. Um, and what I love about Literacy Workshop is that students find a place where they're comfortable to work. You know, it's not just sitting in that desk at that table. It is finding your spot where you're comfortable to read on your own or to partner read or to work or have discussions. And someone may think, oh my gosh, that'll be out of control. But going back to those routines and procedures and expectations, kids know. And, you know, and they love having that choice of where they can go to learn. and. Um, it's that is another reason why classroom setup is important that you have areas for kids that they can go and they don't have to just sit at that desk. Now, I always have students that would prefer to stay at a desk and be in that kind of just structured area, and, and that's always fine. But giving that choice makes a difference for a lot of students. Okay. All right, and so we're looking at independent reading and, and when students are reading to um, themselves. 
Uh, this is when student choice comes into play. So we've been talking about student choice. This is where it really comes into play. Students are involved in choosing their books for their book box or book bag. Um, and they love it. I remember once we'd gone through the procedures and the routines and we, uh, my students would decorate their book box out of, we, they, they would bring in cereal boxes, that empty cereal boxes, we would decorate them, their name would be on it, it would be decorated the way they wanted, and then they were released into groups to pick out books they wanted to put in their book box. And, and it was so much fun to watch them look through and go, oh, ooh, what, you know, do I want this book? Do I want that book? Eventually I'd have to say, you shouldn't have 10. We've got to like, you know, give them the number that they should have in their book box. But what does that independent reading look like after they've chosen their books for their book box or their book bag? Um, we talk about there's three ways to read a book especially for you think, I've got kindergarten or first graders that can't read. How can they independently read? Well, we've got three ways we can read a book. We can read a book by reading the pictures. You can read the words, or you can retell the story. So your little kindergarten students looking at those pictures may not be able to read the words, but they are looking at those pictures, creating a story in their head, and they're going to retell that story based on those pictures. So independent reading can work for all grades. Um, you want to teach them how to pick out a good fit book, and we're going to talk about that, and that's on the Padlet to give you those instructions on what does it look like when I need to pick a book for my book box or my book bag. Um, managing the materials. Um, teacher making sure, you know, you want to check the book box. They have choice, but you want to make sure those are good choices that they've made and they were able to pick that good fit book for themselves. Um, when you have this independent reading, students will dig deeper into those compelling questions by researching that topic. Um, you know, our framework, curriculum frameworks are based around those compelling questions now. And so you can pull books for students to have to choose from that are uh, based around that compelling question for that week. This will be a perfect place for students that are third and fifth grade. They could work on a Think Circa module during this independent time. Um, and what's great about our work with Think Circa is Think Circa has matched their modules to our curriculum. So as I finish my work on, um, as we're redoing the frameworks, I send them my module. They look at my compelling questions and then they go through their modules and see what fits um, my fra our framework in that module, and it'll be linked right in your framework. So you could pull a Think Circa module out of that framework and put it in that independent reading time uh, for those students so they can do the research, so they can do the writing piece, and you can go back and forth and conference with them um, through that Think, Think Circa lesson. So we want to go back to our Padlet really quickly, and we're going to look at independent reading. And we've shared some information there. I've like I, I speed through this thing. I can't. There you go. So, what does independent look reading look like? Here is a little anchor chart that shows you. The, you know, you're drawing this out, and you're making this with the students. And you're going to say, okay, guys, when we're reading independently, what should that look like? And they're going to say things, and you're going to control kind of what's going on in this anchor chart. And you're going to be like, well, oh, yeah, we've already kind of said this or that. And then you want them to tell what does it not look like. And they love to give you the, the I, it does, shouldn't look like this, and we shouldn't do this, and we shouldn't do that. So that's that moment of building community, and they feel like they are part of that. Um, literacy workshop in the community and so you're going to sh share what does it look like what does it not look like I also linked in um, thinking stems with your students so you know when they're reading independently you want them to kind of be thinking about what they're reading and what they should be doing and depending on your standards or what you're working on in whole group you can pull from these thinking stems and tell them, okay, this week during independent reading, 
you may be talking about you know, asking, answering, asking questions. So you want to pull from this thinking stem and say, I want you to pick two or three of these thinking stems and respond, you know, to your reading. What did you read? What are you wondering? Why? Or what am I, what you're confused about? And using these thinking stems can also be a way that you're going to go back and kind of look through what they've written and you can talk to them about, conference with, or this is just a way to observe, are they understanding what's going on in that story or that book they're reading independently? I also linked uh, some few, a few, um, tools that you can use during NTI because you're thinking independent reading during NTI. What if students don't have books at home? And a lot of our students don't have those opportunities, but we've got wonderful tools and resources um, and that you all may have some that aren't here or linked on our NTI um, tool and task. Link some of those in the Padlet and we can take a look at those and share those with other teachers. But Epic, you know, Epic is a tool where kids can get on books. You can set your whole classroom up. You can control it also. They can read it. It can read to them. It's a wonderful tool to use during NTI or when we're back face-to-face. -face. I've linked the Kentucky Virtual Database where um, there are several tons of books there that kids can pull up and read from that database. It'll read it to them. Uh, it's a wonderful tool. And here are Kentucky text sets that you can also share and use with um, students. And when you click on the Kentucky text sets, if you've never been on, you can also go to resources. It won't let me. And it also has a lot of um, tools that you can use during NTI that we also use have on our toolkit, but there's some awesome um, resources there for you. So I link those onto the slide so they're always there with you and you can go back and forth. But with this independent reading, right now I want you to stop and take a few minutes and, and think about what would that look like during NTI. And you can go back to that, um, the tools and tasks that I shared with you um, at the beginning and look through some of those suggestions. Could I use that with students during independent reading? You want to think, what would that look like during NTI? Shelly, do you have anything to share about independent reading? No, I think that, um, no, I just think that the, having the tools is what's really important. And I do want to remind them about the tool that you had, like you just said a minute ago, um, the tool that you, uh, the document that you inserted in the beginning mm -hmm. has, um, those have been vetted already and approved by JCPS. So you can feel safe to use those with your students. And um, so don't forget to look over those too, because I'm seeing a cross check with these. That's yeah. awesome. Yes, the, the tools that were shared through JCPS have been vetted. And so, yeah, I would stick closely with those, but you can also look, and most of those on the Kentucky Tech set are uh, what we've shared in our, uh, with our tools um, because we do use Kentucky Tech set as we're uh, developing our curriculum frameworks. All right, our research and inquiry. So this is another station. So you've got independent reading and we, I like to call this like this research and inquiry station where kids are working together or in groups and they are working around that compelling question. Um, using the compelling questions that, uh, that are in the module of the curriculum frameworks, um, students will get a chance to research a topic that can be related to one of the compelling questions found on the curriculum frameworks. It's a, this is a perfect place for um, PBL and personalized learning. This is a perfect place that you've started this discussion and whole group about a compelling question, and now they're going to dig a little bit deeper, and they're going to talk together, and they're going to work through some things. They're going to read. You're going to have um, 
books based around this compelling question pulled. You can have articles pulled. You can have just uh, all types of text ready for them to kind of dig through and research. And um, where they're just going to be able to bounce back off each other ideas and, and they're right about it. Um, this is usually a popular station um, where it says, which is great uh, for students um, to apply literacy skills within authentic text uh, context. And they love the topics they choose to research. And that's when you really see a lot of learning going on when they can do that research and they can dig deep. Um, my hopes for the future is to offer um, more PD um, and using Inquiry Illuminated, where it is turning that literacy workshop into a literacy reading writing research workshop. And that's when you just see learning grow. It's, it's just amazing. Um, if we go to that Padlet, And let's hope I don't sp speed through. There we go. Our research and inquiry. Um, here is powerful anchor charts are created with children. And we've said this before. Don't just be up there or drawing it the night before or that morning. Do it together um, because it's, uh, it's more powerful. And you don't want pre-made or purchased. You can save your money. All you need to do, I would put my money on um, chart paper. I would just invest in chart paper. I, whenever I would spend classroom money, I would just buy chart paper because, and markers, because you're going to be making these anchor charts together. And when you make it together and then you hang it up, that student knows where to look, where it is, what it's for and why it's there. So this one is um, accountable talk. So when they're in that research group and partnered up, you're thinking that'll be too loud. I'm going to, how am I going to control that while I'm with my guided reading group? Well, you make that anchor chart. What did you mean? And you're going to create, how do they talk to each other? So they're not arguing. What did you mean by that? We have to teach kids how to talk to each other in this um, station. And this is just an example of an anchor chart that you can use to teach them how to talk to each other. So when they're in that group or partnered up, they can look up to that chart and go, oh, this is what I need to say. This is how I should word this for them. And it makes a world of a difference um, classroom managing that. And then we have academic discussion frames that we've shared with you. This is what you want. You're going to teach them to say it's almost like you're thinking stems for discussion. This is where you're going to think, show them this is what you're going to share your thinking, how you're going to build on your ideas. And so that those examples are there for you to share with your students. You have to teach them how to do that or they or it won't work because they don't know how. And so once you take them through this process, it makes a huge, huge difference. Shelly, do you have anything to share with uh, our research and inquiry? Um, no, I just think it's the most easy way to keep kids on task and have them applying standards, uh, standards and skills and concepts because they get so passionate about it yeah. mm -hmm. and, and they work, you know, and they work so hard. They do. And, and it is, and I, sometimes I, as a teacher, I lose, I get carried away by watching all of the learning that's going on and the excitement. And it's just like, Oh my gosh, this is so amazing. And I remember when I started to change the way I was teaching reading and from the way I'd learned as a student, you're just sitting here, we're reading this page, right. turn the page, we're reading it. <laughs> and then once I started doing this literacy workshop and then saw how kids actually love to read, I was just like, oh my gosh, my poor, like first five, six years of teaching those kids <laughs> didn't get the yeah. same opportunities. So once you start working the glitches out and, and you've got those procedures and routines and you've taught them how to independently read, 
you'll you will love it as a teacher yeah. and and you will really it helps you grow I, I think it helps yes you I think a, a lot of growth for teachers of any age or how how many years you've been in the classroom is we're very controlling creatures because we <laughs> we want to know that everything's okay and that it's everyone's learning you know but you have got to be okay with um, a method to the madness is what mm -hmm. the way I have always called it it looks like madness but I'm telling you there is authentic rich learning going on and when you turn it over to kids I always called myself the lazy teacher mm -hmm. because they were doing all the work they're doing all the thinking and it wasn't as exhausting for me got to let go of that control you're gonna wear yourself out so that's just my advice because it was a growing pain for me like Dominique says when I thought oh my gosh I, I've just done such a disservice to kids in my first five to six years and I, and I just you know can't tell you how much you just have to let go of that control <laughs> that, was so, that was so hard for me but but you do um, you're just not as tired because yes. they're doing the work mm -hmm. they're doing all the work yes and I, I have to say like the first few weeks of school my principal or principals would come in and I'd be like okay this does look a little like trust me just put your trust in me this is going to work and I would be like come back in a month and you're gonna be like oh okay it is working because they'd walk in and be like what's going on but I was like trust and you have to yeah. trust yourself too because there's in the beginning and setting it all up and and getting it going there's going to be glitches. There's going to be things that happen, but you've got to be like, yeah. okay, reflect. But this, I'm telling you, literacy workshop with your yeah. stations and your guided reading is, is the way to produce lifelong learners in reading. Yeah. And be very consistent because um, that's when, if you can be anything, be consistent because things are going to come up and you're going to have to be flexible, but just keep in mind the child. And um, I was going to say something that you had said, Dominique, that was amazing. Uh, it, it is, oh, it is scary for administrators to come in and see such chaos, but the test scores went up. Okay. Yeah. My test yeah. scores went way up. And data is what it's all about. And it works. We've got proof. Yeah. Quali qualitative and quantitative proof. <laughs> yes. Okay. So now we're looking at partner uh, reading or shared reading book clubs. You know, uh, partner reading, shared reading. And then you have book clubs for the older students when they can meet with their groups or partners. And, and a lot of times those book clubs, I did pull certain books out that I wanted them to choose from, but they would choose the book. I didn't say, okay, this group's doing this, this group's doing that. I did kind of control by pulling a certain amount of books out. And then they picked that, that group or partner picked a book that they wanted to read. Um, so this is doable um, for all grades. So students can pick books from classroom sets or their book box to read to each other. Um, you're going to check for understanding and I'm going to take you back to the Padlet and we're going to have examples and show you what that looks like. Um, choose a partner, choose a successful spot to work. So that's when you have built that classroom setup. They can go and sit. And, and like Shelly said, we like to control and I have OCD. And so I, I would be watching like, Oh, do that. Should they go over there? Oh, I can't see. But if I had to believe in my pro, you know, in the whole process um, so I had to let go a little bit and we're gonna talk about sit how do you sit and they love this I always say eek elbow to elbow knee to knee and they know you that's how you sit and I did say you're not on your stomach you're not laying on your back you're not on, doing a head headstand see you're gonna sit eek elbow to elbow knee to knee choose one or two books to read um, and then you're gonna talk about I read you read you can say, I read two sentences, you read two sentences, depending on the grade. Or you can say, I read a paragraph, you read a paragraph, I read a page, you read a page. 
but these are all things that you have taught and gone through the procedures um, before you start this station. Um, and then you've got coaching or you've got voice level. You te teach them. What does it sound like to read partner read with someone else? Um, and then you've got coaching or time. And, and this is where you have to teach those conversation protocols too. Um, and we'll take you to the Padlet to show you that. And here is, it's giving you just a broken down phase. And this is the Daily Five, the cafe that I like to use. Um, how do you launch it? What does it look like? And that's all we have at the top. And then it breaks it down to uh, the purpose of this. Why do we want them to partner read? And it tells you, you want to improve, improve their fluency. Um, it helps to practice checking for understanding and their comprehension. It's, you know, when people walk in, think, oh, they're just reading to themselves. But it is, you know, building that literacy. Um, and then it'll take you through this whole process. And, you know, you're going to read the whole time. Stay in one spot. This is the anchor chart that you're going to create together. What does this look like for you? Get started right away. Ignore di distractions. Work on reading stamina. Perseverance. And then you're going to tell them what I'm going to be doing is I'm working with other students and, you know, I can't be interrupted, but this is what you are doing. Um, and at the top, it's fun, improve fluency, practice comprehension, and then it'll tell you what you, what's going to happen next. So it, this right here will take you to the, through the steps, the process of what partner reading is going to look like. And here I have, um, you can share with students what you're going to do. You're going to sit next to each other with the same book. Now you have to teach them what they're going to say to each other. And you have to teach those little conversation protocols, you know, you, using your manners. You know, you don't want to argue. We're not going to fight. So it's going to say, would you like to read? Yes, I would. Thank you. Um, decide who will, who will read each part. Like I said, it may be couple of sentences and then the next reader or it's page or paragraph they're going to decide that and they will and and it'll and, it'll, and it works um, take turns reading and talking and this is an important piece because you want them to stop and make those connections and have a conversation about the story not just read straight through it but talk about what they're wondering talk about what they have connections with um, you're just when you teach them how to do all of this, this works. And um, I, I just, and they love it. They do. All right, Shelly, do you have anything to share about partner reading or book clubs? Um, the stamina is really important. And that took me a long time to figure out. Because you can't force someone to love books right away. And especially if you're a type of kid that, prefers to learn through moving around and touching it and feeling it. It can feel awkward to have to sit, you know, and stay with something at first. So one of the things with K1 that I figured out was um, making a game of it in the beginning of the year where I put a timer on really low and then as a team, as at the timer was on, I would rotate around because, you know, in kindergarten, sometimes they don't have the book right. They need book orientation. They need, you know, just help with, you know, turning pages, just little things that we don't think about. Um, and I would walk around and facilitate and just be there to help and support for, I think I started out three minutes and five minutes and then we build and then they loved it and they, you know, would get excited that their team had, you know, read for you know, seven minutes by, you know, October or something. And what that does is that internalizes that, that in stamina internalizes so that when they are expected to be in on task in a center, they're able to do that. Um, and with enjoyment. And I also, 
we always called it let's eat and read because Miss Barber loves to eat. <laughs> and so I, you don't have to do this, but that's what worked for me. And I always had Cheez-Its or something or raisins or gra We always had something to eat while we read because that made it just so much better um, to enjoy that book with some food. But, um, and then sooner or later, they never even asked for it because they were so into their books mm -hmm. when it was time to do some self-selected reading. Yeah, I agree. That stamina was, yeah, once I started reading about it and thought, I, I haven't been building student stamina. So when, you know, third grade or fourth grade, when you start taking those state tests and the passages and the kids weren't used to sitting that long reading independently, you, you know, that made sense. And so when we started working on building our stamina, we did time ourselves. And then I even sometimes would give that little thermometer and they could like color in and, and time mm -hmm. themselves when they were independently reading. And then they would color in, oh, I read for 15 minutes today. And they yeah. started and it made a huge difference um, with the uh, length of time they could read independently during yeah. other things like testing. I, yeah, I just took it for granted. They knew how to do. I mean, yeah. I was like, stamina, I have to build. I, what? I have to teach that? I was yeah. like, I thought that they came to the table. And no, you know, because some love to physically move around. And, and when I thought about it, I was the same way. I was the exact same way. I did not want to sit and look at a book. I would rather, you know, move around. So just don't take things for granted when you're setting up your workshop. You got to teach every little bitty thing. Yes. And remember, then you also partner reading, you can have them respond also to thinking stems that yeah. um, are aligned to that standard that you're working on. So they're not just doing these things and it's not aligned with your standards or going, you know, aligned with the module, uh, the compelling question you're working on, but they are you know, they are, and it, it, yeah. it, it's just a great way. It's just the kids work so well in workshop. Okay. Which is a great segue um, from what Dominique was saying going into, we've already got these resources. Um, when she was talking about the thinking stems that she gave, I used that exact, that, that exact same, um, link that she has in there with my literature circles and um, book clubs and it, it and partner reads because I would always have a couple that need to be on task, you know, because they're like, what are we doing? And, you know, and they get anxious if they don't have something to do, you know, so that just there's kids like that. So um, when you look at your next step forward in guided reading um, pages 257, 286, those modules you're practicing in guided you're doing it in guided reading and you're facilitating and you're responding to them those comprehension you know when it's time to uh during response on that uh template so those kids are all your kids are already familiar with those steps so it's and they're and they're standard aligned so look back there on those pages, she has um, steps and how to do it as whole group because that's where you start even before you take it to guided reading. You start with that um, and then you move to the guided reading. So they've seen it there and then they're doing it naturally in their stations. And again, you could use poetry, magazines. They could use self-selected stuff. It doesn't have to be a guided reading book that they're using to practice those comprehension strategies. So just don't forget to include those in and that you've got a great resource there. And with the um, guided reading, we just wanted to uh, link in one spot some places that with the NTI, there are, um, links here that if you will click on those, they will help you with webinars, give you resources to um, work with your 
students virtually because I'm getting a lot of questions on that. I, Dominique, I don't know if you are, that are like, oh my gosh, help with virtual. And so we know we're hearing you and we are thinking about you. And so um, the district has a link with the literacy support for NTI. And it has all kinds of um, support there. Oh my gosh, I can't even, I can't tell you everything that's on it. There is so much there. And some of the links that I have on the slide are right, are on there again. The Pioneer Valley webinars are wonderful. They, they give you tips on how to do a guided reading virtually. Um, but these links I've got on the slide, the slide that Dominique just showed you are also here. Um, and how did you got a reading remotely? There was one um, thing that they probably did add that just was recent, was a free basic leveled reading assessment from Literacy Footprints. It is not to be used in the place of your running records. You're still going to take running records on that child, but it does in the wild and woolly times of virtual, where you know you might have a kid just all of a sudden they're in your class, they just joined, you're trying to get your guy to reading. And I would use this in person too. If I've had six kids leave and six kids come literally in one week before. And I mean, I know you know what I'm talking about. You have to redesign your groups. You have to talk about the norms again because that's a lot of kids that are wandering around workshop. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. And you want to keep the momentum going. This was really neat. I looked at it so you can pause at any time, take a look at it. It is quick and gives you that general. Uh, reading levels so that you can insert them into a group quickly and then take your anecdotal notes and your quick running record, you know, to uh, make instructional decisions more concrete for them. And Fontes and Pinnell has a lot of great stuff. A lot of schools have the Fontes and Pinnell guide reading. They are my love. They're the, you know, that's how I learned mm -hmm. to, to even teach reading was through those two with phonics, uh, just all of the resources. So they have a website. Um, if you do have the guided reading for your and the BAS at your school, there's great resources there. And I do. I did look at it last night and I think. I did see that they're trying to add some virtual things to help their teachers out. But again, this is the people that have purchased the guided reading um, with Fontes and Pinnell. There's some great things on there. And then everyone talks about, oh my gosh, where's the writing? Well, it's everywhere. It's all day long. And as teachers, we want to be intentional about giving feedback to them. Um, when we're looking at those standards, uh, I know it's a lot when you've got 24 to 29 kids in a room, but I didn't pick every single um, writing task that I found to, to give feedback on. I just randomly picked you know, certain ones, but they've got to have it. And most importantly, down there where it says share feedback and revising, mm -hmm. they, even the young, this is a first grade class, and they were given writing feedback to their peers, uh, to this little author that was sharing. So peer feedback is critical, and you've got to carve out time for that, like Dominique mentioned, um, on those earlier slides, they've got to have that feedback time and closing of the workshop. So reading and uh, reading and writing is in the content areas. I find science one of the best places to get kids excited about literacy, especially when you bring the best beetles and the animals in and they write up a storm. They, they want to draw them. They want to write about them. They want to talk about them. It, it just so many skills are going on. and. Um, and then, of course, you know, you've got your reading response stations going. And this was always bookmaking station, no matter what I've taught K-5 people. Mm -hmm. I had one of those in every grade. 
They fought to get there all the time. It's like the PBL Inquiry Research Station. <laughs> I want to go there, you know. It's And the books that they came up with and the information that they gave that I had no idea they had up there in their little brain. I just, that is one of my favorite stations too. And you just have to be really organized and good about making sure they have their materials in that bookmaking station. That's the only tip I have. Otherwise, they can, they drive the train because what they what Katie Wood Ray stated, and I agree with her 100%, they will write about what they know and they will write about what you're teaching them. So if you're teaching about being a citizen, you know, citizenship and being friends and social studies or whatever, or a, 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 the American Revolution, whatever, they will end up writing about whatever that passion is that you've taught and that content shows up within seconds and you've got, there you've got some assessment that you can look at. Yeah, I agree, Shelley. Yeah, writing takes place all day long and it's so hard to say it's just in this one spot, but it's happening in content areas. They're right, reading, uh, responding to their reading and they're writing about it. You can, you have those stations and then you've got that sharing feedback and revising and it allows them to grow as a writer. So when yeah. you're giving them those choices during reading and they're writing about it, I mean, it, it's just, it's just happening all day long. Yeah. And I think it's okay with such a tight schedule because we're all worried about those instructional minutes. It's, I've actually done a, a writing PBL and, um, I, those stations were set up for what the students needed for writing. And so my mini lessons were writing for that couple of weeks because that was a unit that I was putting in. And they, they came up with authentic published piece, pieces that went out to authentic audiences. So that's how you get your uh, genres in and um, for all grades to the on demand. Same thing. You could you could create an on-demand unit, and that will be what the kids will have these really come up with these really creative ways. Um, I've seen lots of great stuff out there on a station that will uh, uh, help students with on-demand those skills that are needed. They're way different skills than they are for authentic publishing for publication uh, not a whole lot but you're in a whole different testing environment and it's on demand you know so um just think about the units i can't stress that dominic has done an awesome job on those curriculum frameworks and and designing units using the uh template that's where you're going to design your year. And if you can get those units, you will get everything in. So, thank you, Shelly. And I should uh, want to tell them that um, the K through five ELA um, frameworks are being completely redone. And so I have completed module one and modules two through four will be done by the end of September. And as I, uh, as they're being completed, um, Shelly's helping me out. They're going to be, um, I will go ahead and link them, but we also need to remember they're a living uh, document. So we're constantly adding to the frameworks. So over the next couple of days and weeks, we're waiting for everybody to get back to work and other departments are going to be looking at those frameworks. Yes. Um, we've got DEP, Gifted and Talented. Everyone's going to look at what resources they can add, um, what kind of performance tasks they can help us develop and, and make those frameworks um, equitable for everyone. And so module one is ready to go and two through four we're working on, but I also wanna say that the standards that are in the original uh, modules and units will not change. Those standards are going to be the same in the new modules that we're and units that we're creating. So you can go ahead and look at those standards, what it's going to look like um, in modules two through four, because those same standards are going to be in um, and in that um, they'll be put in through those units the same way in our modules that we're creating um, now. So We'd like to thank you for participating today. 
Um, here's some things we don't want you to forget. Don't forget to add any questions you may have to the Padlet or ideas that you would like to share with other colleagues. We want you guys to put things in there. Um, one thing about the Padlet is if someone puts something up, you can comment on it and say, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. Or did you know what? I did this also, but this is how I did it a little differently. So we want it to be a place where we can come back and share ideas and, and share questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Now we can answer questions. Give us those questions. Um, and then other teachers can go, oh, I had the same questions. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, yeah. We would also like for you to fill out the Google form that we're going to have linked here for you. Um, it's not there yet, but once we share this uh, slideshow, when you pull up the slide deck, it will be there for you to click on. That's one way we can, uh, we can see who uh, viewed the slide deck, who viewed this session, and it also has a few questions that we want to ask you about what are some other things you need us to help you with in the literacy, you know, put, making, uh, putting the literacy workshop to work, getting it to work in your classroom or during NTI. Shelly, do you have anything else to say? No, I think I'm, I, yeah. <laughs> what Dominique said. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you again for um, yes. coming in and listening to our session. We are so glad you did. Um, just thanks. And we hope you have a great year. And remember, we I'm going to also link my um, office hours on this slideshow. I am office hours from nine to 10 every day. Um, the next couple of weeks, I will be out of the office because I'm having a knee surgery. But after that, um, you can meet there. I know not everybody's schedule fits that nine to 10, but just shoot me an email and we can schedule a time that we can meet if you have any questions or need some help with something. Um, but thanks. Yes. Thank you guys. It was great.